I'm sitting here in what is Ingrid's community. Clearly, this community is different because she has brought good. She has brought good into their lives. One of the most interesting healings that Jesus performs is the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida. He does it in two stages. He spits in the man's eyes, the man first sees people that look like trees, and then he regains his sight. There is a lot of writing on why this could be, but the truth is we can only guess. I think that Jesus invites us to participate slowly in incarnational ministry, the kind of ministry that is hands on hands, flesh on flesh. When you give to the World Mission Offering, you make it possible for global servants like Ingrid, like Juan and Denise, like Keith and Debbie, to live incarnationally in their communities and bring God's good healing and hope. Thank you for making all of this mission possible. Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning. As you just saw from the video, we are still in the middle of uh, receiving offering for the World Mission Offering. And a little bit later, we'll hear from one of our mission partners, the Borquists. Uh, next Sunday is Communion Sunday. And we want to invite you to our drive up communion, which we will be doing from 8.30 to 9.30 in the parking lot here at church. And at this time, we invite you to sing with us uh, as we worship together.
in Jesus' name from wintry Wellington, New Zealand. We're so glad we can be with you today, at least in video form. I had great plans to be with you in person this month, but the world has changed and we look forward to visiting when international travel is again possible. Bruce and I, my name is Anne, we serve as global consultants through International Ministries of American Baptist Churches. We raised our daughter in the Philippines and our son in Brazil, in fact, We've been serving for over 30 years as missionaries, Chris. We'd like to give you a brief overview today of what God is doing in and through us as your missionaries. Our theme scripture verse for our ministry is 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 to 20, that speaks of our calling as ambassadors of Christ. We work primarily with Baptist conventions in Southeast Asia, and we encourage them in, in ministries like community and economic development preparing and sending their own missionaries, leadership development, and accessible theological education. For the time being, we're switching everything to, nearly everything, to virtual kinds of communication, doing our training, consulting, prayer time, planning, everything via the internet. So for example, I recently met with colleagues from four countries to discuss how to move our discipleship training online for group leaders. In the Philippines, we're working on a new Master of Arts in Pastoral Counseling program at Central Philippine University. I'm excited about this because the program will ex equip church leaders and members from across Southeast Asia to help their people deal with depression and emotional turmoil caused by the after effects of the pandemic. And then, uh, this is one of my favorite ones, I recently facilitated a short-term mission project that connected Katie, a young ESL teacher from Ohio, with Marcia and Maria, two Brazilian missionaries who serve in Spain. Now, Katie taught English classes online to young people in Marcia and Maria's evangelism outreach ministry, and all this via the internet. That's an example of mission from everywhere to everyone. And here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we're very involved with our home church, Wellington Central Baptist Church. And in fact, serves as interim pastor right now for the church as it's seeking a new lead pastor. I'm involved with leading the intermediate age junior youth program, and we sponsor weekly discipleship groups at our home. And in a bit of good news, I just finished my doctorate. I studied <laughs> faith-based social entrepreneurship. So if you want to know more about that, just let me know. Um, as we look ahead, we actually have hope because we're seeing God's people respond to the extraordinary needs and challenges of the day with great compassion and creativity. We see that God is teaching us, all of us, new ways to be the church, when of course we're together, but when we're apart. We are so deeply touched that partner churches and individuals in our network continue to have a global vision. Like you. <sighs> We have new opportunities to participate and contribute now that churches are moving online. So this is opening up a, a, new, a new blessing for us. So thank you for walking with us. You know, as we say here, we are all in this together. And in, we also have another saying here in uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, Tia kaha, stay strong, be well, be kind. God bless you. God bless you. I am so glad to hear the ministry around the world, especially through the Bocas ministry. 
And we are so glad that God gives us the opportunities to give. Let us bow down and pray for the offering. Lord, the offerings we bring to this place are only a faint gesture of our love, but you give importance to them, you receive them, and use them to spread the good news of your love and the salvation that is in Jesus Christ. Thank you for allowing us to have a share in your work in the world. We ask you in the name of our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you, Tony. Will you pray with us? ជាព្រះដែលគង់នៅដល់ខ្លាយឧត្តមជាម្ចាស់នៃសេចក្តីសង្គ្រោះរបស់ទូបង្គំយើងខ្ញុំកូនសូមសេចក្តីមេត្ត
and the glory forever. Amen.
Please hear this reading from Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Here ends the reading for the day. May God bless this to our minds and hearts this morning. Dear God, we are so grateful um, as we come into your presence that though we live in a world that is imperfect, though we live in a world that, as the scripture tells us pretty clearly, is fallen, as our experience tells us, has struggles, has difficulties, Lord. Dear God, we thank you that in the midst of all that, there is hope that you, Lord Jesus Christ, truly are our cornerstone. We thank you for that. And we pray, Lord, today that as we think about the fall, the fall of humanity, dear God, that we wouldn't just dwell there as a negative thing, but, Lord, that that reality of our existence would point us to you. Give us hope, Lord as we reflect on the scripture together. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to share with you a little story about my third son, Oscar. Some of you know Oscar. A lot of you don't know Oscar. Oscar's five years old now, but when he was a baby, uh, there was something very funny that he did, and uh, I've never seen any other kid do it. None of my other kids have done this, but one time, uh, Lisa, my wife, and I were just kind of goofing off with Oscar, and we were sort of singing to him, and uh, just kind of like parents will do, just being silly, talking, singing a little bit, and uh, we actually, for some reason, started humming a scale, like do, re, mi, fa, so, like that, but we did it off key all of a sudden. We just kind of were playing with him, being silly, and so we did this thing where it was like da, 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 da like that. It's totally off-key. And it was funny because whenever we sang the scale properly or whenever we hummed it, you know, properly and it sounded right, Oscar was smiling. He might even laugh. He thought it was funny. But then when we threw in that off-key, that sound that was discordant, that just sounded bad, he would actually frown. The kid was only like five months old at the time, all right? He was just a little guy. But we, w- we would sing, we would go, da, 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 like that. He would get this sad look on his face. And if we repeated that a couple times, he would actually start crying. It was the saddest thing, but it was also the funniest thing. So what did I do as a father? Well, I, of course, did it over and over because it was so interesting. It was so unique that he did this. You see, Oscar was able to recognize that something was not right. Oscar was able 
to recognize that something he was hearing just wasn't correct. It was off. Well, I think that we are able to do the same thing with our world. Our world is not perfect. And I believe that the brokenness of our world suggests that something is just not right. Something does not sound right. And this sense points us back to a time when everything was right. During those early days of creation, when people lived in perfect relationship with God. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we started this new series, which is called God's Story, Your Story. And when we started that series, we introduced this idea of creating a painting. And right over here, you'll see we have this green painting. And in the painting, we have a hand that's up top and a hand that's a little bit lower. One of those hands symbolizes the hand of God. The other hand symbolizes the hand of humanity. Because we know that God created human beings, people like you and me, in perfect relationship with himself. And this past uh, week, or two weeks really, because we're a bit off of our series in terms of sequence, you all have come up with some words to describe such a perfect creation. And I don't know if you can see them on your screen, but some of those words are things like awesome, fantastica in Spanish, which is fantastic in English, idyllic, magnificent, green, perfect. We even have the Japanese character up here that stands for peace or peaceful. And so that is the world that God created. But as we know from Genesis chapter 3, which was just read to us, which we just looked at together, we know that that perfection was changed in Genesis chapter 3 as humanity turned their backs on God and effectively let go of God's caring hand. And what happened in the Garden of Eden after all? Well, what happened is that Adam and Eve, the human beings at that time, they broke their perfect relationship with a perfect God. Instead of putting God first in their lives, they put themselves first. And what happens in a world where you put yourself before God and before other people? Well, a little thing called sin happens. S-I-N. You see, they believed a lie, and so they disobeyed God as people have been disobeying God ever since, right up until today. They blamed others. The man blamed the woman, and the woman blamed the serpent. And by the way, people have been blaming others ever since that day. Therefore, sin entered the world when Adam and Eve turned their backs on God. And folks, with sin came injustice, with sin came pain, with sin came suffering, and ultimately with sin also came death. Before sin entered the world, people had a perfect relationship with God. But when sin entered the picture, that relationship was broken. Do you realize that this tragedy is still the current state of our world? You see, apart from God's grace, sin still separates us from God. As we continue our sermon series, God's Story, Your Story, over the course of the next month or so, we will be using, we will continue to use visual art, not only as a method of worship, but as a method of understanding the gospel, God's story at a deeper level, that hopefully will connect with our lives. That's precisely why these canvases are up on the stage again. And so, just like a couple of weeks ago, um, I'd like us to get our hands dirty. And so I've asked a couple of volunteers to join me. We've got uh, Calvin and Giovanni. They're going to come up here on the stage with Bruce, who will be assisting them. And they're going to do just that. They're going to get their hands dirty. They're literally going to cover them in paint, One of those hands that'll be up top of the canvas, at the upper part, will represent the hand of God. The second hand will represent 
the hand of humanity. As they do this, I want us to take a moment to read just two very short but very important key scripture pa uh, passages that have to do with this idea of the fall of humanity. It's the concept that we will be illustrating on this particular painting, which I call painting number two. First of all, uh, go ahead, if you have a Bible, turn to the book of Romans in the New Testament. We're going to look at Romans at a very familiar verse, perhaps to some, but perhaps totally new to others. And here's what Romans 3.23 says. It says this, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Rome, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you flip a page or two over to chapter 6, there, Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. God's story. Key point number two. The second important piece of the gospel story. We're going to talk about that. Before I mention it, though, I want to remind you what the key point was from the creation. Because I think it's so easy for us to overlook that very important part of the story. And that key point, number one, was that in the beginning, God created people in perfect relationship with himself. But today, as we talk about the fall, the second point is this, that sin now separates people from God. I'll say that again. Sin now separates people from God. And I'll tell you what, I believe that it is people, human beings, who broke this perfect relationship with God. It is not God who broke the perfect relationship with people. It's what we have done. It's what we keep repeating today as we continue to hurt one another, as we look down on those who are not like us, as the ugly phenomena of racism and mistrust continue to divide us. This is the hard part, folks. This is the tragedy within the story, the reality check for all of us. The very reason a cross was necessary. The part of the story we can't avoid. Because you see, apart from God's grace, 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 God's grace, this is the nature of humanity's separation from God. This is the state of a world entrenched in the fall. But if sin separates people from God, this begs the question, what is sin? What do those three letters mean? I'll be honest, in the Bible, the concept of sin is a complex concept. There are many different facets of this idea that we refer to as sin, but I like a one-sentence simple definition that Billy Graham, the famous evangelist that is now deceased and I believe with the Lord, I think he did a good job summing it up. And here's what Billy Graham said, that a sin is any thought or action that falls short of God's will. You see, sin includes anything bad that a person uh, thinks, says, or does. These, by the way, are considered sins of commission, bad things that people do, things that people do wrong. But there are also sins of omission, not doing those things that you know are right. Sin can be individual. It can be corporate within a, a group of people or an organization. Sin can even be societal. The sins of racism, bigotry, mistrust, these are societal sins that manifest themselves in the actions of individuals and groups. These are the sins that are causing so much unrest in our nation these days because not only do they separate us from God, but guess what? They separate us from each other as well because at its root, sin is a rejection of God's will, a letting go of of his caring and loving hand. It is the root of the fall. And there are two important points about the fall from the book of Romans based on those verses I read a minute ago. 
for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, it is sin that separates now imperfect human beings from a perfect God. They're so far from one another. What is the ultimate consequence of sin? Well, the ultimate consequence, as the Scripture tells us, is death. This is the important point for us to consider from the book of Romans. First of all, number one, that the ultimate consequence of sin is death. When I talk about death, by the way, I'm not just talking about what happens when you stop breathing at the end of your life on earth. What I'm talking about is moral and personal separation from God. In other words, our sin separates us so far from God that it keeps us out of His presence. What, what, what does that mean when we die? It, it means that that separation from God will continue unless something is done to take care of the sin that separates us from God. It also means that in this life, we are spiritually dead if we are living disconnected from the God who created us. Through Adam and Eve's original sin in the Garden of Eden, sin entered the world. And with that sin came this concept of spiritual and physical death. You see, in that moment, everything changed. They fell from a state of grace and a state of connection with God. And because of that fall, people are separated from God by sin. But the good news, <laughs> there's really bad news in that verse, Romans 6, 23, but there's also really good news there, amen? And that good news is summed up in the words of the old song, grace greater than all our sin, even though the wages of sin is death, God does not desire that situation for you and me. God's grace is so much greater than all our sin because the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But before we get there, remember, how many of us, how many of us does it say have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? Well, the answer is all of us. Every single one of us. That's the second important point from the book of Romans here. Number two, that sin affects all people. Romans 3.23, the sin problem affects all human beings. Drug addicts, doctors, teachers, students, movie stars, factory workers, teenagers, and senior citizens. It affects good people and bad people. It affects religious people. It affects secular people. Sin affects us all, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That includes the original human beings, and it has included each and every one of their descendants who have lived on this planet since that time, including you and me. You don't believe me? Well, to illustrate the pervasive sin on everybody, and I, in other words, I mean that it affects everybody, even those among us who might be considered good in society. I think it's helpful to look at what happened to Jesus one time. Let's see what happened to Jesus. As I read this passage, I want you to think about this idea of sin. I want you to think about what examples of sin you see going on in the narrative. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn it to Luke chapter 14. And I'm just going to read through it here. Luke 14, verse 1, and we'll get there in just a minute. But what I want to give you here is an illustration of the effects of the fall among those whom many would have considered good people. I want to set this up for you because this was a time when Jesus was invited to a banquet in the house of a Pharisee. And we know that the Pharisees were religious leaders. They were proud of being very good, quote-unquote. They carefully legislated and regulated what they viewed as living a holy life. But when we see how quickly that falls apart, I think it's quite amazing. Because even so-called good or religious people, even they struggle in this area. 
And so I want us to ask the question, not to be judgmental of the Pharisees, but I want us to see how this phenomenon affects even so-called good people. And I want to ask the question, what did the good people do wrong? So let's start right at the beginning. And the ironic thing here, by the way, we're talking about humanity being separated from God today, right? The ironic thing is that there in front of the Pharisees is Jesus himself. So the idea, the concept of being separated from Jesus, who is God, right in front of them, is an amazing one in and of itself. But let's look at this. Luke 14, verse 1. One Sabbath, so it was a Saturday, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he, Jesus, was being carefully watched. We start right there with a problem. Because even at the very beginning of the story, we have a hint of the sin that is already taking place. What did these good people do wrong? What was their sin at this point? Well, I would argue that their sin was malicious intentions. As they carefully watched Jesus, they weren't doing so with a view to be better people. They weren't doing so because they wanted to grow in their faith. No, something else was going on in their hearts. Verse 2, there in front of him, Jesus, was a man suffering from dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. Then he asked them, if one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? Well, they had nothing to say. What did the good people do wrong? Well, not just in this case, but as we learn throughout the Scripture, throughout the Gospels especially, the sin was that the Pharisees were sort of known for making their own rules about the Sabbath more important than God's rules. And that seems to be the case here. In effect, they were adding to the Scripture to suit themselves. Verse 7. When he, Jesus, noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. And I love this. It's convicting, I must say. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself or herself will be humbled, and the one who humbles themselves will be exalted." What did the good people do wrong here as they picked their seats at the table? What was the sin? I would argue that the sin was pride. The sin was selfishness. Thinking of yourself as better than others, as higher, as somehow more important than other human beings created in the image of God. And isn't that a problem even today in our world? Verse 12, Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. Well, what is the sin that is suggested here? Well, I think it's a sin that we so easily slip into even within churches. <laughs> and to use kind of a funny expression, I'd say the sin is being clicky, right? We often think of cliques as a problem in high school. You've got the jocks, you've got the cheerleaders, you've got the, the nerds, you've got the, the band geeks, you've got all of these different groups of people forming cliques, and you're either in or you're out. But let me tell you what, as adults, we struggle with this as well. Even after church, in normal times when we're all together, I've seen those who are friends with each other sort of naturally come together and hang out while a visitor is totally left to the side and not even acknowledged. 
I'm not saying that would happen at First Baptist Church, but I have seen it happen because we have a tendency to do just as the Pharisees did, even though we might be good people. Jesus concludes the episode in verse 13. He says this, But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So do you see how sin separates us from God? Even though, ironically, Jesus Christ, God's own Son, was right in front of them, sin separated these very religious people from him. And sin caused them to despise other human beings, even though they're precious in the eyes of God. In fact, they were devaluing the very image of God in other people, even though God was with them at that moment. But I'll tell you what, folks, this is never, this is never what God intended from the beginning when he created human beings in his own image. And so as we think about the fall as we think about how all people are affected by sin, how those among us, even those who are considered holy, are susceptible to sin by devaluing the image of God in others. As we think about God's story, I think there are some very important implications for your story. And I'd sum it up with this. And that is, despite the fall and sin itself, all people retain the image of God. I'll say that again. Despite the fall, despite sin, all human beings retain the image of God, both those you like and those you don't like, all right? Everybody still retains the image of God. The image of God is such an important expression in scripture, but it's only used actually four times in the Old Testament. Three of them are found in Genesis chapter 1. But what does it mean? How do you define the image of God? I have adopted and tweaked a definition for the image of God that I learned in seminary. A professor of mine, Dr. Gary Brashears, put it this way, that as God's image bearers, human beings were designed to make visible the invisible character of God both individually and corporately as they obey and grow in him. Now, how do we make visible the invisible character qualities of God? Well, we have to understand God's character. I'd like to point your attention to Exodus. Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 through 7. In this passage, again, that's Exodus 34, 6 through 7, God reveals a great deal about his character to Moses. God reveals that he is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, abounding in truth, keeping loving kindness for thousands, forgiving of sin, and that God is just. According to our definition, those are the invisible character traits of God that human beings, men and women, boys and girls, can make visible, both as individuals, but also as a group. Unfortunately, we all know that we human beings struggle with this, don't we? Want proof? Think about yourself. Think about yourself. Let's get personal. Are you always perfectly compassionate like God? Are you always perfectly gracious with others like God? Are you always perfectly slow to anger like God? Are you always perfectly loving and kind, perfectly truthful, forgiving, and just? When God made humans in his own image, he made them completely perfect in every way. But is that the way things are today? Clearly not. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even though people still possess the image of God, it's a little tarnished, isn't it? It's a little imperfect. Even the best and most honorable women and men among us throughout history have been affected by this problem. In Ecclesiastes 7, verse 29, King Solomon says it this way, Behold, 
I have found only this, that God made men and women upright, but they have sought out many devices. And if it weren't bad enough (laughs) that we're sinners like those Pharisees in Luke chapter 14, we're no better than them, by the way. I need to say that. We also mistreat our fellow human beings who, like us, bear the image of God. In Malachi 2, verse 10, the prophet asks some tough questions that I think we should ask as well. Do we not all have one Father? Has not one God created us? Then why do we deal treacherously each against his brother so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? What's Malachi's question? Why do we deal treacherously with our brothers and sisters even though they are just as precious to God as we are? Quite simply, it's because we are imperfect. We, like them, are fallen. But, fortunately for us all, God's intentions do not change. God originally created us in his own image for a purpose. And though even for those of us who are good Christians, our reflection of God may at times be poor at best, God still wants to restore the image of God in us, calling us to the cross, conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. You know, I have to level with you. There's no other way to put it. Today's topic, the fall of humanity, it's pretty dismal, isn't it? The idea uh, that apart from God's grace, every human being is naturally separated from God, well, that's a bit sobering, I think. But thank God that he doesn't leave us there. Thank God that in the midst of this darkness, there is light. You see, despite the tragedy and darkness of the fall, the good news is that there is hope. Amen? There is hope because God wants to restore the image of God in us. And in Colossians 3, 9 through 10, God calls upon us saying, Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. My friends, there is hope. Amen? There is hope because in fact Romans 8, 29 says that as believers, we are conformed to the likeness of Christ. And in Colossians 1.15, Christ is called the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. There is hope, people, because eventually, on the other side of life, God promises to all believers in 1 John 3, verse 2, that we truly will be like him. On that day, When we are with Jesus, we will once again bear the full, untarnished image of God, no longer warped by the brokenness of this world. I've got to invite you, as much as I don't want to, but I've got to invite you to face the reality, to remember the second key point of God's story, which is this, that sin separates people from God. If even religious, so-called good people like the Pharisees could struggle with this, who are we to think that we would not? This is difficult news, isn't it? But does the story end here? Absolutely not. Remember that God created us to have a relationship with him. And and he continued loving us even when we rejected that relationship. And because people were unable to, to do anything to bridge the gap between them and God, guess what? God did something. When we were unable to do anything, God did something. He came down. He died on the cross for us. He took our punishment in himself. Remember how Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death, that difficult, horrible statement? Well, that... That is why Jesus, who was without sin, died on a cross for you. He took the punishment for all your sins when he died on the cross for you. But he was more powerful than death, more powerful than sin itself, because he rose again on the third day, and then he ascended to heaven. Do you believe that today? Do you know that in your heart 
to be true. You see, even with painting number two, even when we talk about the fall, there is hope because of grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. I want to challenge you as we wrap up today. I want to invite you to do a homework assignment, just like a couple weeks ago. I have two requests, actually, as we think about our, our fallen world and this idea of separation. We're looking for words. First of all, I want to challenge you to come up with one or two words that describe how you feel about the COVID-19 pandemic. That shouldn't be too hard. We all have an opinion on that, right? Secondly, I want you to come up with one to two words or phrases to describe what it feels like to be separated from people that you love. And if you join us for Bible study this week, we'll talk about that more and how those words might relate to the concept of the fall. One of your words or phrases might be chosen to be put up on one of the paintings that uh, we're working on here at the church. If you're interested in getting involved in creating these paintings, you're welcome to join us here at the church. Uh, we have a patio on Taylor Street that will be set up, and anybody and everybody is welcome to come and help us to paint some of these words on painting number two, which is all about the fall. But for now, let's pray. My friends, if you hear my voice now, if God is doing something in your heart, as we've talked about something very difficult, and if we're being real, can be quite unpleasant, I don't want to leave you there alone. But I want you to know that if there are things that you struggle with, guess what? There are things that I struggle with too. We are all imperfect human beings. We're all in need of a Savior. We're all in need of Jesus Christ. So I want to invite you to reach out to us. Maybe something is just not right in your life. You've done some things in your life you're ashamed of. You feel a need to be forgiven. You realize that there's something that seems to be separating you from God. Well, if that's you, and if you think you can't be forgiven, guess what? That's not true. That is a lie. You can be forgiven. Jesus died on the cross so that you could be forgiven. All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is believe that Jesus died for you so that you could be forgiven. The moment you do that, he forgives you. God forgives you. The separation between you and God, that is history for you. Forgiveness is offered freely to you and to every single human being on earth who will simply come in faith to Jesus Christ. It's offered so that you can say with gratitude and hope, it is well, it is well with my soul. Lord God, as we conclude our time together, I pray for the one who's listening who feels that things are not well in their soul, who is unsure, who senses that they are missing something in their life. Lord, I pray for that one, for that individual, for those people perhaps, that you would help them to know that it's not something they need, but it is someone. It is you, Jesus. You who have paid the price. You who were without sin came to die for our sins. Lord, I pray for the one that needs to be forgiven for the first time today. I pray for the one today who knows you already but comes to you again and says, Lord, I just I need forgiveness again. I just need to be renewed. I pray, Lord, for all of us that as we have come to this time, as we have talked about this difficult subject, that we wouldn't be afraid of it, that we wouldn't ignore it, because to do so gives us no explanation for the difficulties in our world. But Lord, I pray that it would give us a context and so that, Lord, we would only appreciate your love for us, your grace even more. 
Thank you, God. May we all be able to say, no matter what happens in life, because of the cross, because of Jesus, it is well with my soul. Amen. I'll tell you what, this is one of those songs, and I know it's an old song, and that doesn't matter because if you don't hear this song and be moved, you need to check your pulse, okay? I got to read to you. This is our hymnal these days, all right, because of COVID. But here's what it says, verse 3, powerful as can be. Here's what it says. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. 
If I had a microphone, I would drop it, but I don't. That's what it's all about. That is the core of the gospel, folks. That is the core of God's story. It is the core, I hope, of your story. We are so glad that you've joined us today. We'd love for you to reach out to us. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to get to know you if you're new to us. Just email us at prayer at fbc-portland.org. You can also contact us through Messenger or through other means as well. But those are some good ways to do it. God bless you. Have a great day. Know that God loves you and has a plan for your life no matter what. Amen? Amen. Amen.